Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining um, the IGF 2023 Open Forum 37, Planetary Limits of AI Governance for Just Digitalization. Um, I think everyone's, all of the speakers are here. Thank you, everyone, for joining on site and also online. Uh, we are broadcasting this event also hybrid. So I think um, we should gather a lot of insights and also a good uh, balance of questions online and on site. Thank you uh, for coming here. Um, uh, my name is Carlina Octaviani. Uh, um, I'm artificial intelligence advisor uh, for Fair Forward Indonesia and also Digital Transformation Center Indonesia, a global initiative dedicated to open and sustainable development and application for artificial intelligence in Africa and Asian countries on behalf of German Federal Ministry for Economic Corporations and Development, BMZ, implemented by GIZ. I will be your moderator for today. The session will run uh, with discussion led by the moderator and also some speaker will send uh, also a presentation and later we have a question and answer session, so please be prepared with your questions. And if you have an opinion or response, we also welcome that. And we we'll, shall begin the session. The digital transformation increasingly contributes to the greenhouse gas emissions to ensure sustainable artificial intelligence or AI. Uh, there's a need to limit the ecological and social risk. How can we ensure that sustainable aspect are considered on the development and deployment of digital technology, such as AI, and how we can form the basis of digital transformation. In this open forum, we will discuss options for action for the sustainable development for ICT and of the ICT sectors and technologies, especially for AI. I will introduce the panelists for this session. For impulse statement, uh, we have Martin Wimmer here, Director, General Development Policy Issues, Gener German Federal Ministry for Economic Corporation and Development, BMZ. We have uh, on that side, Noah, Noam Kether, Senior Public Policy and Government Relation Analyst of Mozilla Corporation. We have Robert Opp, Chief Digital Officer of UNDP. And joining online, we have Atsuko Okuda, Regional Director, International Telecommunication Union, or ITU, Regional Office for Asia and the Pacific. Uh, also joining online, we have Chem Sidiwat, Director of Center for Inclusive Digital Economy at the Asian Vision Institute and Advisor to the Council for the Development of Cambodia. To begin, please welcome Impulse Statement from Mr. Martin Wimmer, Director of General Development Policy Issue General German Federal Ministry for Economic Corporation and Development, BMZ. Please welcome, give the warm welcome. <laughs> you can clap your hand. <laughs> Thank you. Yesterday morning, I went to Rio and Chi. This World Heritage Site in Kyoto endures as one of the most inspiring gardens ever built by mankind since the 15th century. It is a rock garden. Basically, it consists of 250 square meters of flat gray gravel and five islands with rocks on it. It is rectangular, like a screen. The gravel representing dots. You see, it can mean, it can mean anything you come up with during meditating there. And it is a it is a metaphor for the technological design, the shaping of nature, and the current five hype digital technologies, AI, quantum computing, whatever everyone is crazy about. It is a metaphor for the millions of websites in the internet and the five platforms that stand out. It is a metaphor for all the millions of users and the five founders who get all the attention and money. It encourages thinking out of the box. And whether you think the digital transformation leads to good or bad, the lesson you get from the rock garden at the Rio and Chi is that the more you focus on the five outstanding highlights, the more you watch the rocks that steal the limelight, 
the more your attention will shift to the gravel. If you look long enough, if you think deep enough, it's the gravel that makes the rocks shine. There are only 15 rocks and millions of pebbles there, but the task is to leave no one behind. For our discussion today, this could mean to emphasize the importance of a human-centric perspective. What does the big platform, the new technology, the great solution, the fascinating vision of one of our outstanding speakers mean for the people who do not stand out and do not get all of the attention at first sight? The poor, the children, women, people with disabilities, LGBTI+, people in the global south, oppressed people, indigenous people, victims of terrorism and war. You don't need to be a Zen master. It's just common sense. Whether you are a gardener or a coder, whether you use a shovel or a server for your work, using technology, data centers, AI, to change the world, nature, societies, human interaction, should never be for technology's sake, but for improving the lives of every individual living with us on this planet and to secure the integrity of this one, our Earth, which translates into safe energy, safe water, safe resources. Don't believe in growth. Don't fool consumption. Don't produce waste, which, to be clear, is the opposite of what the digital economy does most of the time, most of them. If you're serious about carbon neutrality and a just transition of our economies to sustainable economies, we have to act as a gardener, respect, tend, nurture, not exploit data centers. Do what the rock garden does. Remain within given boundaries. That's why the German development policy supports the global realization of human rights, the fight against hunger and poverty, the protection of the climate and biodiversity, health and education, gender equality, fair supply chains, fair working conditions, the democratic, social, ecological, feminist, inclusive use of digitalization and technologies transfer to promote sustainable development goals worldwide. Thank you. Give your own welcome. Please clap for Mr. <laughs> Wimmer. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Wimmer. I really like the analogy of making it as an ecosystem that grows everyone in the AI. So let's begin the session. I will remind you that this is an open forum, so I will encourage people and invite people to prepare your questions, your rep response, your opinion, if you have any points that you want to discuss, uh, we're open to that. And first, we'll go to UNDP, Robert Off, Chief Digital Officer of UNDP. So let me ask the first question. How can we form broader efforts to integrate sustainability in ICT technologies and global digital uh, governance, including AI? Thank you so much um, for having me at the panel. Thank you, Martin, for the poetry. Uh, I knew you were gonna deliver something inspirational. Um, and you're absolutely right about the boundaries. Um, couldn't agree more. Uh, I think I would like to start with just a general reflection on the issues that we're talking about here. Digitalization and climate, these are quite possibly the biggest mega trends that we have globally right now. Um, they are changing everything about the world, but they're doing it disproportionately. And so we know that a disproportionate burden of climate change is borne by developing countries. Um, we know that digitalization is happening at different rates globally, and developing countries are at a disadvantage when it comes to the speed of digitalization or the technology generation and things. And then between these two concepts, there is a tremendous interaction that goes, it's a bi-directional. So on the one hand, digitalization presents the possibility to take dramatic positive action against climate change. On the other hand, we know that digitalization is driving carbon emissions. It's also 
contaminating soil for the extractive industries that are uh, had, that have grown up around building, you know, chips and and um, technology platforms, the rare earth minerals and so on. And it's even the data center uh, techniques of using cooling water um, that is not a closed loop certain system can contaminate water sources and things. So there's a really interesting, I mean interesting, <laughs> um, uh, important interaction, bi-directional interaction between the concepts. Um, I think that one of the things from a, a, a UNDP perspective that we really work with, when we work with countries worldwide on their digital transformation um, and we're engaged, well, we have digital programs in 125 countries. We are engaged in about 50 of those countries on questions of national digital transformation. And I think that our, our partners are in the developing world, but they, like pretty much um, most countries, tend to put some of the environmental, regulatory, and, and important governance discussions on the back burner in the favor of quick digitalization. And so one of the things that, that we really try to do in our approach when we work with a country and we look at their readiness for digital transformation or their readiness for artificial intelligence, because um, we do that kind of assessment as well, we try to uh, place those questions centrally. And it's about putting people and their rights, their right to, um, uh, to for the economic and social rights to development, but also the rights for the uh, environment. And we put the questions in front of countries. Um, what If you're using data centers, are you doing that in a green way? Or have you looked at optimization for efficiency? Have you looked at the carbon footprint of the digital change you're making? Um, are you transparently disclosing environmental impact of technologies that you're adopting? Um, and like I said, our countries are, our, our partners are developing countries, but I think every country in the world needs to put this as a central concern, particularly those who are driving the technologies. Um, and I think the last thing I would say is simply that um, if we look toward what it's gonna take for global action in this, it really is going to be that this has to become the norm, so that these are central questions. And given going back to that point about disproportionate impact, I really think that we need to send the signal in the, in the global north that is developing a lot of these technologies that um, we must find ways to ensure that the environmental impact, the greenhouse gas footprint of the technologies that are being used uh, is seen as a priority in terms of data center efficiency, um, reduced uh, e-waste, reduced contamination and so on. Um, so those are just a few initial thoughts around that. Thank you so much. Give a warm welcome to Israel. <laughs> and next we heading online, Atsuko Okudad, Regional Director of International Telecommunication Union, or ITU, Regional Office for Asia and the Pacific. Um, Ms. Atsuko uh, will present a presentation uh, on the on examples of green ICT city standards, how can they support governments and stakeholders to develop sustainable and circular ICT, including AI? Uh, Atsuko, if you're ready, you can start. Give yes. a warm welcome Thank to Ms. Atsuko. Thank you very much for giving. Thank you. First of all, I would like to thank the organizer to invite ITU to this very um, important um, meeting. And I believe that uh, Robert also shared that the topic is very timely. We should perhaps think about our action uh, in terms of how to ensure that the AI development as well as ICT development um, are greener. And I have um, a few uh, statistics that I would like to show from the recent studies. Um, let me start with the chat GPT and uh, um, rapid uh, rollout of uh, AI solutions globally. And uh, I am uh, sure that uh, you know all the participants have been using or experimented the use of uh, generative AI such as chat GPT 
and uh, the power of uh, the solutions that are in front of us. I just want to share with you, um, with the participants, that uh, there are many interesting and innovative use of uh, ChatGPT. One of our ITU um, senior officials got married recently, and I believe that uh, he asked ChatGPT to write his uh, marriage vow. So I hope that that was successful. But uh, they are increasingly um, very uh, uh, interesting and uh, uh, widening use of uh, ChatGPT in our social life as well as in our workplace. Now, the question perhaps it, which is very relevant to this session is the environmental impact of an increasing use of AI because the tool itself is not um, material in a way. And it is very difficult to quantify the environmental impacts. But today, I would like to share with you the two uh, aspects. One is the electricity consumption, and second, the green gas uh, emission uh, in this presentation. So um, as you see on the screen, I hope that uh, um, you are seeing the flipping slides. Um, of course, um, the uh, increased use of AI is supported by the increasing uh, the, the transmission of data. And um, those data are stored, as Robert mentioned earlier, in the data center carried by um, different means of uh, telecommunication. Now, that data center, as you know, consumes lots of electricity. And um, as you may have heard, uh, in the other sessions, there are significant progress in making data center energy efficient. However, one study still suggests that the training of AI solutions would require 3.5 million liter of water to cool the, uh, the, 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 the facilities itself uh, for the computing. And additionally, there is a study that they, in terms of the um, greenhouse gas emission, um, the top um, most telecom companies are estimated to have produced uh, 260 million tons of uh, carbon dioxide equivalent in 2021. So there are certainly benefits, but there are some environmental impacts that we have to consider. So um, because of these uh, two aspects of digital transformation and the need to green, some scholars coined the, uh, the phenomena as the twin green and digital transformation, which means that the digital transformation should take into account the environmental aspects. And AI can certainly um, enhance uh, many uh, uh, different aspects of the twin green and digital transformation. For example, AI can enhance the predictability of demand supply for renewables uh, across a, a distributed grid. And of course, as you know, there are benefits uh, to improve weather forecasting by incorporating more of the real world systems in calculations. So the question I believe is the balance that we must find between these two, the green part and digital transition, uh, the, the transition part, and to get best out of the twin transition. Now, um, coming back to the, uh, the data center, um, there are two, as I mentioned, the components in terms of the data center operation. There is a cooling part that will be required and there is a significant and largest uh, uh, the energy loss in the facility. And the cooling replacement for water includes the uh, refrigerants, which could contain uh, harmful chemicals. But in addition to that, there is globally um, increasing data traffic, and that is generated from uh, low and middle income countries because they are now investing more in the storage and hosting solutions to meet the increasing demand of the internet users, which are increasing uh, uh, in these uh, economies. And 
that will require more data centers in these locations and that may consume more um, electricity um, according to the latest statistics. Now, that's the reason why um, we, ITU, have been working with uh, partners such as uh, GIZ to ensure that the green aspects are integrated into this digital transition and digital transformation. And one entry point to ensure that is the public procurement to make sure that um, uh, in the process of uh, procurement, to establish data center or improve data centers, the uh, green and environmental aspects are considered and taken into account. So um, another entry point to ensure the environmental aspects is the e-waste management and to manage the critical raw materials. As you know, um, there are more internet users globally, mainly in uh, middle and low income countries, which means that there are more devices for people to connect to the internet. And by 2023, over 70 million tons of e-waste are expected to be generated annually. And um, as you may, have, you may see on the screen, it is estimated that the storage of the expected 2025 global data sphere alone would require up to 80 kilotons of uh, neodymium, uh, sorry, um, which is about 120 times the EU 2020 demand for this material. And at the same time, the critical raw materials um, can be extracted from this process of recycling if we do it properly. And we hope that um, the member countries, as well as industry, academia, and in partnership with uh, other stakeholders, we can create a circular economy to ensure that the e-waste are discarded safely. At the same time, that will regenerate and that will recover the critical raw materials. And in addition, ITU, as you know, have been working on the standardization and recommendations to ensure that best practices are applied um, uh, on these uh, critical aspects of uh, environments and the, uh, the environmental performance. And I hope that um, today's discussion will shed light on some of these uh, uh, topics, including the green ga uh, gas, uh, the, the gas uh, emission, as well as the e-waste and data center management. And finally, I just want to highlight one point that um, we should also perhaps encourage a wider uh, societal groups to be aware and to be exposed to this discussion through their awareness uh, raised on the benefits and challenges of AI solutions in their societies. And I would like to share with you as a second question to um, uh, my intervention at the ITU has been implementing an AI project to build capacity awareness um, across different uh, stakeholder groups in these four countries supported by the government of Australia. So that was my last slide. Thank you very much. Back to you. Thank you so much, Asuko. <laughs> Next, we go to Noam Kanter, Senior Public Policy and Government Relations Analyst of Mozilla Corporation. So first question is, what's the role of civil society and business, and what are the specific challenges of communities on the Africa continent on sustainable AI? Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Um, Regarding the role of business, um, the first thing I like to do is zoom out to consider tech companies as just companies. Um, an example of what I mean is that one thing companies do just as companies is invest in other companies and in, and in financial instruments. So um, I guess my uh, question zero is, um, and uh, really a primary question is, is a tech company investing in companies or partnering with companies that exacerbate the climate emergency? I would say that's the bare minimum before you start thinking about the tech they're implementing. Um, I think another thing businesses can do uh, is share best practices in terms of how to make products uh, more efficient and sustainable. For example, this year, um, we at Mozilla created a way for developers using our advanced Firefox developer tools to track the carbon emissions of the software they're developing. Um, so I recommend you go have a look at that if you're interested. Um, 
I think civil society can also play a really significant role in education, uh, especially regarding the climate impacts of technologies such as AI. Um, my, Mo my Mozilla Foundation colleagues wrote a review recently of all the climate, of many of the climate impacts of the internet and AI usage, um, including you know, how much energy is used when you're on a Zoom call when the video is on versus when the video is off, which maybe you all have seen. Uh, and it's been a really popular article. Um, I think that shows that people want to know the impacts of the tools that they're using. Um, but in the case of technology, that information can be really hard to find. As for specific challenges uh, on the African continent, I have to say that I'm not on our Africa team. Um, I do want to tell you just a little bit about our work there, because uh, I think the team does great work, and I'm really proud of it. Um, I, I just want to echo also, first of all, the um, uh, disproportionate impact of the climate emergency on the African continent, um, which was previously discussed. Um, one thing we've done is in 2021, uh, Mozilla partnered with AfroLabs uh, to study the African innovation landscape. Um, across the continent, uh, the study that we did with them found key innovation barriers, such as access to funding and finance, local policies to protect and enable the ecosystems, lack of access to affordable connectivity and internet, which is a big one, um, and a general need to collaborate across the regions that they studied. Uh, Mozilla's Africa Emirati project is working to fight these barriers. Um, I think many of the same barriers affect sustainable technological development in the area. Um, but ultimately, we think that uh, communities should be able to speak to and try to solve their own uh, challenges with support from others. Um, that's why the Mozilla Technology Fund, which supports open source projects with promising approaches to solving pressing issues, recently announced that the theme for this year is AI and environmental justice. The fund will provide $300,000 to open source projects that leverage AI to make a positive impact on the environment and local communities. It includes one year of Mozilla mentorship and support, um, and awardees will likely be announced in early 2024. Oh, interesting. So if you want to, <laughs> you are welcome. And if anyone wants to explore more, you can ask later about the funding. And we go online again to Cham Siriwat, Director of Center for Inclusive Digital Economy at the Asian Vision Institute and advisor to the Council for the Development of Cambodia. Cham, are you ready? Okay, he's online. Yes. So what's the role of civil society and business and what are the specific challenges faced by community in Cambodia and specifically on AI? Yes, thank you very much for your question. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, the organizers for uh, inviting me on this panel of very esteemed and distinguished panelists. Uh, just to let you know, I've been following the IGF for a very long time in my research. Uh, it's always been a dream to come and attend, but uh, unfortunately, I wasn't able to join in person, uh, but at least I'll be able to uh, join the panel online. Uh, and so on to the question. Uh, maybe I'll start with the second part first, uh, since we're talking about uh, specific challenges faced by Cambodia on sustainable AI. Uh, I think the first thing you think of uh, when you think of Cambodia might not be related to uh, technology or let alone sustainable AI, uh, but maybe I can just share a little bit of the context. Uh, and so pre-COVID for the last 20 years, uh, Cambodia had been experiencing 7% GDP growth annually, uh, so developing extremely quickly. And I would say that within the last five years, uh, Cambodia has gone through its own form of digital transformation. If you were to visit around five to 10 years ago, you would see that uh, we predominantly use cash everywhere. Uh, also making it more complicated, we are a dollarized economy, uh, meaning that we are on dual currency, both with the USD and our local currency. Uh, and so basic things like going to the market or taking a tuk-tuk for transportation around uh, you would have to do these things very uh, manually uh, and having complications of converting currencies and so on. Uh, and basically what happened throughout the last few years, uh, a very high digital adoption rate, uh, we've been able to, let's say, leapfrog uh, the era of using cards, credit cards, debit cards, uh, and move straight into mobile payments, transfers, uh, and QR code payments. Uh, and so that, the main reason I would say is uh, because of Cambodia's young population, uh, with two-thirds of the population under the age of 30, a median age of 26. Uh, we have quite affordable uh, mobile data and access to Wi-Fi uh, within the urban population. This has allowed us to uh, really move forward uh, in terms of digital transformation. And so now if I can just go back to the uh, question of the theme for today on sustainable AI, 
uh, we face different types of challenges uh, from the previous ones that were mentioned. Uh, because we could say that we joined late uh, to the game, uh, our focus is really building it uh, from the ground level up. And because we don't have any uh, legacy technology or any established uh, long-standing institutions in terms of AI, uh, we rely quite significantly on looking at the models of our regional partners, on looking at what's being uh, done successfully around the world, uh, and also learning from others' mistakes. Uh, so in terms of sustainable AI, we are, let's say, building uh, a strong foundation from the beginning. Uh, we don't have any existing specific policies on, on AI or specific uh, to sustainable AI. And so I think looking at uh, regional models, what's being done around and can locally contextualizing to Cambodia's situation uh, is very important. And so uh, if I could just elaborate a little bit more on the role of civil society, uh, on behalf of our institute, on the AVI uh, Asian Vision Institute, we are uh, an independent think tank. And so what we've tried to do uh, over the last four years in Cambodia is to uh, provide policy research uh, and also uh, capacity building and training related to the digital economy. And so over the last four years, we've published two books, uh, one of them on uh, Cambodia and cyberspace, another one on Cambodia's emergent cyber diplomacy. Uh, so really giving an overview of the digital economy uh, what kind of role does Cambodia uh, as a small state play in the frame of global governance? I know that will be uh, onto the next theme and question, so I won't talk too much about it. Uh, and so with that, I would like to close my uh, opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you so much. Give a warm welcome to Tim. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, so I think we can move to the second round of questions. I come back to Mr. Robert Opp. What type of alliance for global digital governance are needed? Okay. Hello. Okay. Um, no, thanks for that. I think all of these interventions so far have drawn attention to um, some form of, you know, angles that we're talking about. The, there's sort of private sector, there's um, uh, the civil society, you know, the importance, there's governments and so on, the importance of bringing together the stakeholders um, can't be overemphasized. And of course, that's what IGF is about. Um, I think in this space, the biggest role for alliances is around alignment of purpose, alignment of intention. Um, and I can just give a couple examples in this space uh, of alliances that we're involved in um, and that I think have some hope for the, the directions that we need to set globally with this. Um, the first one is, is called CODES, which stands for uh, Coalition for Digital Environmental Sustainability. Um, and that is an initiative uh, with the German Environment Agency with the UN Environment Program, UNDP, the International Science Council, and Future Earth. Um, and uh, actually recently, uh, Atsuko ITU has also joined CODES as one of the kind of core members. Um, and CODES has engaged with over a thousand stakeholders in the last couple years uh, that it's existed. And it really is trying to get a few different things. One is around political alignment for the, the kind of these issues of the twin transitions. Um, the, you, then there's sort of a set of initiatives around mitigating negative impact, and then there's accelerating the innovations for efficiency. Um, and so this is a kind of um, broad-based coalition, I would say, and there's some action lines that are being developed now. And I think it really just highlights the importance of really coming together on, under common purpose. The second alliance, um, which is a little bit more focused on the topic at hand, is, is called the AI for the Planet Alliance. And that has been created by um, the Boston Consulting Group, uh, UNDP and UNESCO, um, plus a, um, a, a coalition of startups um, called Startup Inside. And it's a group, uh, a kind of an odd group in a way, of players that are engaged in this issue as well, but specific to artificial intelligence. And it is really also about providing a platform where we can identify and promote innovations that are 
uh, again, driving innovations that can help us with environmental action as well and, and scaling them, as well as looking at ways to really encourage the players in the artificial intelligence space to adopt more efficient and more environmentally friendly, more sustainable uh, approaches to their work. Um, and, and these are, um, you know, again, things that are very multi-stakeholder in nature, um, open for participation of many. The, the organizations I mentioned are just the kind of spearhead uh, organizers, but really open for all to be involved in. And that's an open call for everyone who's listening in today as well. Um, these can be found, I'm not gonna give the websites, but they're both, they can be Googled uh, and found online um, and, and encourage everyone to participate. Thank you. Yeah, additional resources for all our uh, discussion later on you can also share. Um, we go to Noam. Uh, so how can we move towards sustainable digitalization? Thanks. Um, I want to talk about transparency first. Um, I talked about it a little bit with the education bit before, but um, I do think we need a, a transparent look at the environmental impacts of tech tools, um, including AI. Uh, so, you know, transparent, uh, sustainability reports are often a big um, tool towards transparency, but as we all know, there's a spectrum of transparency um, when, when it comes to reporting. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about what we do in our sustainability report um, uh, as maybe an example, because we hope that we're leading the way. Um, so my understanding is that per the greenhouse gas protocol, which is um, one of the reporting standards, we're not required to calculate or report the product use emissions um, associated with using products like Firefox, Mo uh, Mozilla Hubs, and Pocket. Um, but we want to lead by example. Um, we want to support transparency by reporting the optional data. So we started doing it actually in 2019, um, and we're hoping that it'll encourage our peers to do the same. Um, what we had to do though, was we had to work with an external consultant and we had to develop a brand new methodology because no one had really developed a methodology for measuring the impacts of browsers, um, uh, the environmental impacts of browsers. Um, and you know, we hope that it uh, accounts for device emissions that can be reasonably attributed to the browser so that um, you know, it captures the work that we're doing and what we, can con what we control. So it's possible and vital that companies report on this aspect of the work. I think the hope is that we're showing that it's possible um, and we're encouraging others to do so. Um, and I think the hope is if the impacts are too high, they should consider changing their product roadmap. Um, now, as I mentioned before, also related to Mozilla developer tools, it's not just about the products that companies build, um, but also for customizable or open source products, it's about giving developers and users the ability to measure and reduce the emissions in the tools that they build. I also want to say um, that tech regulators sometimes have an interesting role to play in sustainable digitalization. Uh, a good example is the Federal Trade Commission in the United States, uh, which is a primary, one of the primary tech regulators in the United States. Uh, but the FTC also enforces against deceptive greenwashing claims. So there's an interesting nexus there. In fact, the FTC has uh, just begun a once in a decade update to its green guides related to um, deceptive environmental claims. Uh, and some commenters have specifically requested that they bolster their enforcement against certain misleading net zero claims or sustainability claims. Um, so, but there are limits to anti-greenwashing policies because uh, they require deceptive representations in the first place. Um, so, you know, they, they're just one piece of the puzzle, but I thought that was just an interesting nexus of how different regulators can work together in the space. Interesting, so measurement and also uh, risk of uh, greenwashing. Yeah. Okay, we can go to the Q&A in this open forum. We welcome respectful, diverse questions and opinion. If you have any question, please kindly write, raise your hand, introduce your name and organizations, and then mention your questions. Also for participants online, I will also remind uh, to please type your name, organization, and questions. We will select the questions to be read online. Uh, so I will give the opportunity for the people on site first. Is there any questions, opinion, or curiosity that you want to ask? Um, 
Yeah, uh, thank you, everyone. Um, my name is Bushri Bhatti. Um, my question is around, um, I think much of the conversation has focused on the impacts after you start um, adopting these technologies or developing them. And I'm wondering like how much work is now being done to really think critically if these specific types of technologies are needed in the first place, because it feels like we're trying to mitigate um, risks that are already being, um, or like certain communities are being exposed to um, those harms and risks and trying to kind of like put things back into the bag that shouldn't have necessarily been implemented in the first place. And you see a lot of this type of development in places like Silicon Valley, um, where there's a lot of investment that keeps going into the development of these technologies that are presented as solutions to really um, systematic problems that we're facing, but uh, fundamentally will fail to do, do so. And we know this as people who maybe work on this uh, uh, through a systematic lens or framework. Um, so I'm wondering if you could speak to some of the work that's being done there, because it feels like a lot of this is just um, responsive instead of being proactive in addressing these issues. Thank you. Interesting. Uh, we will go around. Oh, there's go down? Oh, it's okay, you can okay. go here. <laughs> Well, thank you. Um, well, first of all, um, great to be here. Uh, my name is José Renato, I'm from Brazil, and uh, I have two questions, actually. Um, maybe jumping a little bit upon um, uh, her question, um, we started the session talking about the growth, about the possibility of thinking beyond this, um, let's say, ideology, narrative, I don't know how to put it, but of development, of growth. Uh, we use some of these terms here, so like, uh, what are the opportunities that we have to rethink this? Maybe, is there any other paradigm that we that we could focus on? And the second question, um, after, um, I unfortunately forgot the uh, name of the UNDP representative. Robert, Robert thank you very much. Uh, I apologize, for, I'm terrible with names. Um, you mentioned about uh, the role of uh, countries from the global south uh, in this in this whole uh, theme and how they were sort of not prioritizing, uh, at least as far as I could understand, um, the issue of like sustainability, climate protection over the digitalization. But I would like to hear from you, and maybe if there are any other inputs, would be uh, would be also welcome. Um, how is it like considering that we have all of this push towards digitalization this uh, it is part of the whole uh, imaginary of, of development of how a development a developed economy should look like what would be your take considering that the most advanced centers of research of development the companies that dictate most of the agenda they're outside of these territories so like how do you work with these countries how do you you could potentially work with them to to some degree, either create an environment in which they can uh, build upon, in which it's not like, a, in which they'll be, they'll have the benefits of all of, all of this. Uh, even even when we consider that many nations who are in the advancing these technologies are not fulfilling these these questions. So yeah, thank you so much. Thank you so much for all the questions. So we can move to our our panel, starting with Robert. Sure, I I can address um, particularly that that last question. Um, I in in a phrase, um, the value of local digital ecosystems here is super important, um, and this is very relevant for AI. Um, it's relevant far beyond a sustainability question. The concern that I have and um, Anybody who's spoken to me recently has heard this because I say this over and over again. Um, I am very concerned about the global pattern of rollout of AI systems, particularly generative AI at the moment, um, because I worry about the representation and diversity in the technology, in the underlying data or lack of data, and in the training process as well. And the I believe that one of the most important things that we can do is to look at the ways to build capacity for local digital ecosystems so that local innovators who are, the, you know, um, innovators and entrepreneurs are everywhere, but they sometimes lack the ingredients, and you were talking about that before, Noam. Um, they, they may lack the, the financing, they may lack the skill set or the access to skills, and they may lack the set of tools to compete globally, or not necessarily compete globally, but 
to actually build systems that are locally relevant um, and that will actually work towards satisfying the needs of people um, locally and the needs of the, those markets locally. And so I really think, um, and this will also, I think, benefit the sustainability agenda as well, the stronger the local digital c ecosystems are in these countries around the world, the more I think we're gonna see uh, innovative and fresh looks at how we can address the sustainability issue as well. Um, so that, that would be my response to your, your question about, um, you know, the uh, um, countries, and when I said um, countries are not necessarily prioritizing environmental issues, it's, that's not a criticism. That's because developing countries have a lot on their plates right now and need to, to are desperately short of resources. And in a constrained environment where you're trying to really think about um, where you're gonna put your scarce resources, it may not be the first instinct to put it into something like that. And that actually, I think, needs to, the light needs to be shone toward the, the, the countries of the global north who've basically created this pattern and they didn't think about environmental concerns either. That's why we have this issue. And so um, what we say is that going forward, as we work on digitalization in these countries, we advise our, our country partners to stay aware of the environmental considerations as part of their governance, to think about the policy and, and regulatory environment that needs to be there from the beginning so that ultimately that will pay off down the road. Um, maybe I'll, I'll let other panelists uh, answer some of the other questions. Yeah, you can go, uh, Noam. Yeah. Still on. Okay. Um, I think probably um, I have the most to say on the first question um, about, you know, the question is when should we not implement technologies at all given their risks and their benefits? Um, I think it's the golden question. And um, I guess I just want to talk about the ways that um, trust, the concept of trustworthy AI, it, uh, transparency in AI and transparency in climate impacts all kind of work together um, to create, you know, as ingredients to create, you know, hopefully responsibility here, which is that, um, you know, I, I think one of the challenges is that many, uh, many of the products that you reference that might not be um, very effective relative to their risks, oftentimes people don't know how to measure the effectiveness of those products. Like the, if we're talking about an AI model, people don't necessarily know how to talk about the robustness, the accuracy of the model, potential for bias, um, even though there's been a lot of work on those things that sort of uh, both, both investors and the public and regulators um, are still learning and will be learning for a long time how to, how to measure those things. And so um, I think the more that we can push on the side of trustworthy AI, um, the more it will be obvious to people what they're weighing the um, what they're weighing the environmental impacts against, right? If if it's obvious, you know how trustworthy or how accurate a model is compared to what it's claiming to do, then it'll be more obvious. You know, is it worth it compared to the amount of energy we have to pay for, and and then the um, you know external effects that are uh, that are impacting our climate and economy. Thank you. We go to Martin. Yeah, to your question, um, I would fully agree, uh, the damage is already done. AI is here and uh, we are only in repair mode once again. And uh, the reason for that is uh, the industry just doesn't care about the environmental impact of their money making. And legislation and regulation are way too late once again. All we can do is learn for the next technology that breaks through. We have to be better and faster, and we need the pressure from the civil society and the NGOs here. And, and then we go to online. Uh, Atsuko, if you want to answer the question. Sure, thank you. Um, I have uh, um, two um, uh, maybe examples where um, we can you know, concretize and show uh, concrete examples of how we can um, take into account uh, the questions on AI benefits and challenges to the environment. One is uh, um, the, uh, you know, mainstreaming of uh, um, greening questions. 
ITU um, has been working in the telecommunication sector and digital technology um, for um, uh, many years. Um, and one of the questions we are um, increasingly receiving is to evaluate, for example, um, the, uh, the resilience and performance of data centers. And we have conducted the assessments in a few countries in Asia and the Pacific. But in the process, we made sure that the environmental aspects and best practices are applied in the process of assessments so that the recommendations include how to mitigate um, the negative impact on the environment. And I hope that there will be more of these um, integration of uh, uh, greening and environmental considerations in all the aspects of uh, uh, digital transformation and what we do. But I would also like to add the um, perhaps partnership that we can expand with the industry, especially uh, small and medium-sized enterprises. And I want to give an example of uh, e-waste management that I mentioned earlier, that um, increasingly there'll be data that is generated through an increasing number of devices uh, people are using. And in uh, um, ITU, uh, we have uh, opened a new area office and innovation center in Delhi recently. And one of the topics that we are addressing with the association of uh, SMEs and businesses in India is to encourage innovation and to make sure that the e-waste management and climate te technologies are taken up and mainstreamed in the industry side so that we can make it as a successful and uh, 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 profitable business. And we hope that that will contribute to the circular economy. And I hope I, I believe that more of these business models will be required now that uh, AI is uh, being rolled out very quickly. Thank you, back to you. Thank you, we go to Chem. Yes, uh, just for uh, my final comment. Uh, recently, about last week, uh, I attended a workshop uh, specializing in AI organized by the International Science Council. Uh, and so what we did, uh, they invited AI experts from the Asia Pacific region. And uh, I would just like to share two of the outcomes from this uh, full day discussion. And so the first point is on mindset. Uh, currently we have this mindset and mentality that uh, AI should be the solution for everything. Uh, and this comes at very high costs, uh, not only in terms of sustainability um, and environmental uh, aspects, but even down to the efficiency of actually trying to solve a problem. Um, and so what is happening is that now we're starting to use AI to the extent that uh, it creates more problems than it solves. Uh, and so the overall consensus from the workshop was that we should be extremely careful uh, in evaluating and assessing um, how efficient uh, AI tools and platforms and applications are being used and whether it's actually solving the problem more efficiently and effectively and not in term uh, creating more problems. And so the second part, uh, which I would like to share, is on long-term partnerships. Um, as I mentioned, uh, we were in a room full of uh, very, uh, let's say, qualified in, uh, individuals from, from that uh, field of expertise, and they shared that one of their challenges or the main problem um, is that when they convene together for uh, high-level international conferences or they have uh, workshops or meetings, uh, the time period leading up to the meeting, a lot of preparation and time is involved. Um, all the stakeholders are engaged throughout uh, the event, but the problem is that following up after meeting, uh, not much is done to bring together all the important points that were discussed. Um, so in terms of uh, an extensive report, um, in terms of building long-term partnerships to build on what was discussed um, at those events, uh, because addressing global issues in terms of AI and sustainability uh, it requires a lot of uh, considerations, and these things cannot be solved uh, in one day or in a one-week conference, but it really has to be uh, taken you know, many steps forward into the long term. So I would just like to conclude with that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we go to questions from online audience. Uh, it's Avis from Cameroon, uh, from the Protege QVIS organization. One of the thorny problems in Africa remains the return of e-waste to producer, 
what binding mechanism can we put in place for its effectiveness? If anyone wants to uh, answer from the panel. Ah, oh, yeah, Otsuko, perhaps you can uh, answer. Sure, thank you. Um, thank you for this uh, very important question. Um, I have a question regarding the obligation uh, or problems that uh, um, Mr. Avis asked regarding the return of e-waste to producers. Um, of course, there are policy as well as regulatory um, mechanisms that could bring, but perhaps um, the, as I mentioned earlier uh, in my uh, example, perhaps that could be seen also as um, uh, opportunities to work with uh, startups as well as um, SMEs so that they can recycle uh, the devices uh, e uh, e before, of course, um, uh, e-waste. And uh, perhaps that could be seen as a, a one part of the circular economy. So I believe that, of course, returning the e-waste is one thing um, that could be, you know, mandated. But perhaps we can see a more um, uh, collaborative ways because the producers may or may not reside in your countries, right? So returning to the producer in some cases could be a challenge. So perhaps we can see it from a holistic and uh, um, uh, uh, ecosystem point of view on what's the, the best mechanism to make sure that the e-waste are not discarded in the uh, environment and in the ocean. I'm not sure if uh, we have sufficient time to answer this question, but I believe that this mechanism and how to do this is a very important and essential uh, topic I believe for all of us. Thank you. Back to you. Thank you, Otsuko. So as as your reminder, uh, it's already closing time for our, our open uh, forum. So we'll have a closing statement from each of the speakers. Uh, perhaps we can go online first from Tam. Yes, thank you. So uh, just back to our topic on uh, AI and uh, sustainability. Um, I believe it is a, a long-term journey, uh, as mentioned from our opening uh, statement and all the panelists that um, in certain cases, they have already been established uh, for a long period of time. Um, and it's difficult from the legislation and policy point of view to uh, kind of backtrack or catch up for that matter. Um, and so with that, I think uh, rather than focusing too much on the technology, which is something that's being done in, in the field of AI, we should focus more on uh, the fundamentals, which are utility, and also uh, what are some of the implications? Because if we focus too much on the technology, uh, we think that it's a solution to everything, uh, rather than looking at the overall big picture and weighing out the pros and cons. So I would say that we should take uh, a more uh, big picture approach um, and looking into the long term, rather than just focusing on uh, solving immediately um, what we can do in the in, in the current state uh, without thinking too far ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Atsuko, you want uh, to share a closing remark. Thank you. I want to also add uh, a, a dimension on uh, digital inclusion. As you know, um, according to the latest ITU estimates, 2.6 billion people are still unconnected. And I believe that this process of digital inclusion and digital transformation should continue so that those who needs the digital technology and transformation can benefit from the technologies. But at the same time, I believe that the, we shouldn't forget about the greening part and environmental considerations in the process. And I hope that um, this conversation will continue among all of us or in the expanding community globally so that we can make sure that we can mainstream the, uh, the perspectives and considerations to the environment in the future in our efforts to connect the unconnected and making the digital transformation sustainable. Thank you. Thank you. As go, we go to Robert for closing. Um, I, I didn't expect a closing statement, and I don't have a closing statement, but I do have a couple thoughts. Um, and actually, it, it, even these last couple um, thoughts that were offered about the digital divide and not focusing on technology, I think Jem is exactly right. 
um, the focus here should not be the technology. The focus should be on what best serves people and the planet. And I think that if we stay focused on what best serves people and the planet, um, you know, technology, we're not going to stop the sort of um, innovation for commercialization process. But I think as we go forward in alignment around what needs to happen, we have to keep people, we have to make sure that technology is serving people, not the other way around. And it's the same for the planet. Um, we just, we can't keep that cycle of the planet is here for the taking for the purpose of technology rollout. It's not about that. Thank you, to Noam. I know it's 2.31, so um, I'm between you all and your coffee. Um, but uh, yeah, this was, this was fascinating. And I think what I've been able to see is um, efforts towards sustainable, sustainable digitalization from code to cooperation on an international scale. Um, how everyone in the policy stack, as it were, um, can, uh, can make an impact from where they are. Uh, and it's been great to learn about that. Um, I hope you've also come away with the sense that better practices are better practices are possible in the tech space, um, and that uh, you know there is a way to uh, make progress on these goals, including when necessary, you know, not shipping certain products when when it wouldn't be responsible to do so. Um, I don't have a poem to end with, like like we started with, which is sad, but probably something from Mary Oliver would be good, so you all can imagine that. Thank you, to Martin. Yeah, interconnected networks, the internet, um, are a very old thing. They are something like Tupperware or Color TV or punk rock. Ideas from the middle of the last century. People who were there are at the beginning um, are very old now and have gray hair. The subtext of this conference, as I experience it, is to discuss what the digital transformation means to the internet. It's old heroes, it's old myth, old narratives, old governance structure. And while there's still a community of people who believe in the value of the internet for internet's sake, there might be a new generation out there who considers the internet to be just the oldest of many digital technolo technological artifacts, AI being the most recent incarnation, which are not good or bad in itself a matchstick firing global warming in the worst case scenario, or tools in the fight against the biggest threat of the 21st century climate change when we're good at what we're doing. So I agree that it was a timely and very relevant discussion today. Let's give a warm welcome and closing <laughs> with a clapping hand and energize. Thank you, everyone, for joining in Planetary Limits of AI Open Forum on IGF 2023 in Kyoto in Japan and also online. Enjoy the rest of the IGF uh, sessions. Stay healthy. I'm Carlin Octaviani. Arigatou gozaimasu.